Hello and welcome to KCP Community Meeting October 19th, 2021. Uh, we have a pretty packed agenda because we took last week off for KubeCon. Um, so I will I will start with um, Carol. Am I pronouncing that correctly or even anywhere close? Yes, thank you. Okay, Perfect. wonderful. Uh, we'll we'll uh, talk about your topic uh, for a little bit, but I want to make sure that we get uh, time to talk about the rest of the stuff too. But um, yeah, uh, uh, take it away. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Carol. I'm uh, a developer uh, on the Microsoft Developer Division team, um, working on container tooling and Azure tooling. Uh, some of you may, for example, use uh, the Docker extension in VS Code. That's one thing that I'm working on. So um, here I'm just basically asking for advice. Uh, the problem that we are facing is we um, have a bunch of scenarios where people are developing microservice style slash cloud native applications, uh, and they want to test some portions of it or, or debug them locally, but some portions uh, require dependencies that may run as containers or as emulators or even run in the cloud. And uh, over the years, we have developed various solutions, both in big Visual Studio as well as in Visual Studio Code. And they are kind of one off and a little bit messy, uh, frankly. So uh, the idea that I'm pursuing with a couple of my colleagues here in Microsoft is, well, maybe we have a way to describe uh, those workloads in terms of you know, APIs and, and workloads inside Kubernetes and then you know, some tools are uh, going to uh, be responsible for constructing those uh, APIs or, or, or object Kubernetes object hierarchies, and some other tools will be then uh, monitoring the actual running workload and uh, get logs and attach debuggers and things like that. So you know, it, it, it seemed like KCP would be actually a very good building block for building such experiences, but uh, I'm not super uh, proficient with all things Kubernetes, so I'm just asking like how to do do it or go about that. That that's all. Yeah. Uh, can I can I ask some uh, clarifying questions to make sure that I understand your use case a bit? Um, Please. You you still want to run pods somewhere? You 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 want the you want the developer to express uh their application and and you want it to run pods somewhere it might be it might not be in a multi-cluster like hosted prod scenario it might even be like on your local machine or on some you know shared machine somewhere but uh running pods is still the goal yes run pods or maybe also ordinary processes so okay. one thing that that um, we have been thinking about is having sort of an executable CRD where, where you run just a regular process on your local machine. Interesting. That actually that actually matches a use case that we discussed pretty early on of um, like you could run like a compose, you could put a compose CRD in there and have something on a local machine that, that translates that to compose. Um, are there, I mean, one and like not to jump over, Jason. Jason, did you want to continue that thread? Do you have a second question or? No, I'm I'm happy to take it wherever it goes. I, I was gonna. It was interesting because um, we we trying to be as generally applicable. I'd say the multi cluster orchestration is like the most concrete use case, but we didn't want to monopolize the discussion. We kind of want to leave the door open for people to say, "Yeah, I'd like to do this with this." Um, we wanted to be open to that. Um, because I think like it, we would hope that it is generally applicable to a large class of problems, not just cube container orchestration problems, but uh, those we're, we're really in the prototype phase right now. So that's kind of the, we're kind of looking for those use cases. So if you wanted to drive or to ask or to participate, I think that would be well within what we'd want to allow or, um, you know, collaborate on. Yeah, I would say, uh, uh, especially early, early on, I think we're doing better at it, but I, we can always do better. Uh, it's been hard to get the messaging right of what KCP is. Like KCP is is both the 
minimal API server that everything is a CRD and it's a, a pluggable API control plane uh, that looks very similar to, to Kubernetes. But it's also this like engine for multi-cluster stuff. And so if you don't care about multi-cluster stuff, it can be very uh, muddy reading docs and reading, like even just in, involving in these conversations, like to, to for people to myself included, probably mainly myself, to uh, talk about KCP only as the minimal API server and not as the core of this you know, thing that you don't care about. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, to, to Clayton's point, a, a long time ago, we talked about various ways that KCP or something like KCP could help with development scenarios. And also like you you linked the, um, the embedded low resource scenarios some folks have reached out asking about how KCP can be used in like IoT scenarios and edge scenarios and things like that. And I think the the case in their case, it wouldn't be in order to run pods, in order to run like Kubernetes. Uh, you certainly could run Kubernetes on those edge deployments, but if you just wanted to like have a process running and its state synced up to some, you know, KCP that aggregated state of all of the things and has some control mechanism for starting and stopping and monitoring these processes everywhere. I think KCP could be a good foundation for that central like control node across all of those things. And the, the benefit is that you actually get like the user gets a Kubernetes style API that with, with controllability and the edge device doesn't have to run Kubernetes, doesn't have to, you know, schedule pods and have all of the heavyweight Kubernetes stuff to do that. Um, so it's very similar to your your use case where instead of like an edge device somewhere, it's a developer's workstation where they're running some process that someone they they or someone else wants to monitor and, and control from uh, a centralized place. Um, yeah, at at some point very long ago, um, we had tried the quite mad idea of plugging a, a virtual kubelet to an uh, a KCP API server. Of course, since there was no, you know, nodes and, and node name and stuff like that, it didn't go uh, up to, to, to the end, but that was quite uh, interesting. And, and even without going this far, uh, it could be quite easy to just build, you know, have locally a controller running against your KCP. And when you detect uh, an, a labeled deployment, you just create the right pod through podman that corresponds to the pod template of your deployment or something like that could just be a way to mock very easily with KCP. Uh, the fact that you, you submit a cube request, a, a, a cube resource, which is mainly a deployment, but then you have it started locally through podman or stuff, or stuff like that. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is this, is this always a local case girl? Like, do you think it's a, um, uh, like it's a uh, single machine or small individual user case, or do you see other types of use cases where you might want to run something for someone? Um, I wouldn't say run something for someone, but we have this scenario where you're building an application and you're taking advantage of some cloud services that do not have a good local counterpart, like some sort of, uh, I don't know, you know, the image classification service, whatever, that doesn't have a way to run as a container on your local machine. And so then you would want to deploy part of this workload to the cloud and link it with the part of the workload that is running locally. So that scenario is definitely there. Um, but I, I honestly haven't spent too much time thinking about it, but I don't know if KCP would be involved in, well, maybe not. I, I'm going to stop here. <laughs> I haven't and, thought about it. You know, aspirationally, um, there's a, there's a use case, which is, could we make, could we make, well, that's a awkward, sorry, I'm tilted. Um, could we make like the idea of a generalized control plane for most of like dev iteration, like, and, and dev is always a, a loaded term, right? Like, yeah. you know, some people are happy with their command lines, their Docker composes, their cube controls, their Terraforms, their 
paths platforms um one of the thoughts would be the transparent multi cluster is like really pragmatic like it's going from cube today to a use case above and trying to catch those cube developers but there is that aspirational part that if if we could succeed if we could bring a bunch of ISDs together like the tools are good enough that most people could use GitOps for any of their flows tecton could work across any types of resources like it'd be awesome if tecton had more things to drive. Argo could deploy CD anything, like you could CD to VMs or to cloud formation templates or Terraforms or Docker composes, and they all kind of work together. That's a very like, uh, you know, techno libertarian or techno freedom future where we're like, oh, it's the control plane for everything. But that is a ways away. Um, having examples of use cases that challenge that like we thought about the local dev, it's like it's local dev and being a control plane for local stuff would help us understand what's different. So I think we'd be very open to any experimentation in this space and the how we experiment is we, we, I think we'd be as open as possible. Right now we're just kind of prototyping in the repos, but we're starting to get more serious about the prototyping. What can we split up to make it easier to prototype is very much within, um, you know, if there's a working group that's going after local stuff or teams or people who are using it, we'd be very willing to to make that possible. Perfect. Yeah, definitely. I, I think uh, concretely, if you are uh, if you are interested in prototyping with this and hit any problems, please you know reach out and we'll try to uh, help or move around it or whatever. And if especially if in your case the multi cluster. Uh, stuff that we are driving at is making your life harder for some reason. If it, if we're we're binding these things too close too closely together, and it's you know we're tying stuff up that you have to untie to do your work, uh, let us know, and we'll uh, try to be more rigorous about uh, you know separating these things apart. I don't know if that is the case yet, but definitely without somebody keeping us honest and and trying this, I think we we might uh, slip into that. So let us know if if we're making it hard for you. Thank you, and 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 thank you for all the um, information and advice. One last quick question. So, what is the best way to collaborate? Is it, uh, you know, GitHub discussions? Is it something else? What what do you guys prefer? I can't speak for everyone, but I don't think there is a. I don't think we are a mature enough project to have ones that we prefer or don't prefer. If you uh, if you reach out on the Slack, uh, that's that's so far I think has been pretty uh, pretty responsive. I uh, saw that you sent an email to KCP users and I did not see it. So uh, maybe that is maybe that is the least uh, least trafficked one. But the the Slack and these meetings and issues and discussions at GitHub, um, I think, uh, yeah. Uh, sorry about missing your email. No and problem. And um, I'd probably say uh, if ideally um, like KCP start the binary is intended to show off the prototype or the demo flow. And we're like, okay, yeah. we want to iterate on that demo flow and show a couple more ideas. If you'd like to have your own demo flow and you need changes for it, I think it's really a very simple, is this an easy change to make or does it, is it something different? And if it's something different enough, having a separate binary that shows off a different concept with a different uh, demo directory mm -hmm. that shows off the yeah. idea, it's totally reasonable. And also if you want to fork the repo or ask for us to stay stable on some aspects, like we're, we're trying not to put too many changes in that don't just show ideas. And so there's a right. little, we're being, we're playing pretty fast and loose right now because the goal mm -hmm. is to get to, we could do a second prototype, um, demo that shows um some of the like the app movement the sinker the multi-transparent multi-cluster also some of the organization and workspace stuff um and then after that i think we're probably going to go back and say what are some of the structural things that we change to start really executing long term so Perfect. and maybe I, I could add that there is already a, a way contributed by some i mean some someone i don't remember the name um that allows you uh, creating your own command line of kcp just mm -hmm. uh, you know by creating because the server part uh, api server part has been extracted and so you can just create the server part uh, inherit from the usual arguments command line arguments and then mm -hmm. especially add uh, as many um 
post start hooks as you want, which is yes. very useful, of course, to register your tabs and, and do whatever you want and start your controllers. So that's already available today. Perfect. I'll, I'll check that out. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Great. Um, David, you are you are next up on the uh, agenda, such as it, such as it is. Yeah, so as, as we had discussed two weeks ago, um, after the demo we, we made with Joachim about the workspace over KCP with, you know, abstracted ingresses, the KCP ingress controller from, from Joachim, um, we had discussed a bit about this. I, I will open a, um, a quick presentation. Uh, yeah, so yeah, we had discussed a bit about um, what the ingress case um, showed, in fact, um, the fact that you have the um, object status, you know, and when you sync an ingress typically to the physical cluster, it will set the host name um, field of the status to uh, the host name that is related to the physical cluster. But what you want to see externally from typical non-KCP over clients of the KCP logical cluster, this is the host name that will in fact point to the proxy that will drive you know, your ingress to whatever physical cluster the workload has been, has been assigned to. So, and we have discussed about that because then you have finally, the sinker from the physical cluster will change the status of the object. And then you have the KCP ingress controller that sets up the envoy proxy, et cetera, that will have to change this status uh, to put the right host name. And then we, we we see that here, of course, there is some sort of ownership problem because you are going to um, fall into a, a constant loop. And so the other way uh, we fall back to was to create a distinct ingress, just a copy of the uh, standard ingress, uh, normal basic ingress added by the external the workspace controller. So we had to copy it with a distinct name. And then of course, on this one, the sinker would sync the status from the physical cluster. And from this ingress with the new status, we would build the, the final status on the, on the ingress, which will be seen by the external controller. But this, this had led us, or could have led, led, led us, sorry, to problems as well, because external uh, controllers, like the dev workspace controller, uh, they expect you know, the, the, the landscape of, of the objects that are derived from, from the, the, the main custom resources to be in a specific state. And if you start adding new objects or adding new stuff or changing an object, then of course you changes the you, you just you know unexpectedly change the conditions that are expected by uh, the behavior of the external uh, controller. So there is in fact a twofold problem, either a, an ownership problem if you keep the same object uh, for the status, for example. Or a sort of you know visibility problem so that you add stuff or change stuff in the uh, you know the, the current context of of an external controller that is targeting KCP without even knowing that it's not standard cube. So, so yeah, I was sorry. I was gonna so David like one note here is like did you already start a doc or something that works through both the use case, the implications? Because this is all stuff that we're going to basically go over and over and over with everybody who ever hits this. So this is like a pretty fundamental design trade-off yes. design. Do you have a doc in motion already? Yeah, well, I, I have a five, I think, five uh, slides and, and, and a demo of something we've been, yeah, we've been thinking about that the week before with Joachim and then implementing that last week. So of course it's just a prototype, but yeah, I have some something to propose in fact today uh, for this and to submit to your, you know. <laughs> yeah, because like this is a, um, the, this is definitely one of those ones that we will keep coming back to over and over. So like as a yeah, thing yeah, that sure. is a candidate for like a design doc and yeah, exactly. uh, education like documentation plus design doc because like we're going to learn from it um this is yeah. one that really needs to be there probably you know we yeah. can start with the google doc shared with kcp dev yeah. but sure i just wanted to you know present that quickly uh, i try to be okay. quick and and then we can discuss that and of course it could be translated to to a design doc 
uh, with all the amend amendments we, that would be necessary. Okay. So that, I, there I are, just jumping in because I wanted to make sure that, that we ended up with this because there's a bunch of deeper yes, details I'd sure. like to move in there and so it can broaden out over time. Yeah. So, thanks. Yeah, what I want to, to show is mainly the is really the main ID and the way we found it could be implemented quite simply uh, in the current state of, of KCP. So of course, there is the case of spread deployment, which is a bit uh, even more, you know, changes because you create two additional deployments uh, with the it's you know the deployment splitter, and then of course fully transform objects. We had discussed about creating Istio resources from a KCP ingress to uh, sync to a physical cluster that uh, supports Istio, for example. And so uh, after thinking a while on all these use cases, it seems to it seems to me that in fact what we need is some sort of two levels of visibility and a and, and also, finally, two steps thinking. Um, what this means is mainly that transform or additional objects that we add, for example, for the, uh, the spread deployments, should not be visible from KCP clients. That the fact that we should not change the context of the client. And the other thing is that original and transform objects should be in isolated context. Because in the most simple case, where, for example, you just want to change the status of the to update or tweak the status of an ingress, you don't necessarily want to change the name of the ingress because there might be some assumptions in the underlying you know, pods or that will be created by the whole process that the ingress has this name. So the, the, the more we can keep the names and everything synced up to the syncing to the physical cluster, the, the better it is. And so the idea um, in order to, to do this quite simply, was that to think that in fact we already have a way to isolate objects it's just logical clusters i'm not speaking here of workspaces which is mainly the you know identity of a logical cluster but here really of the underlying cube feature and so the idea was to in fact have two lo distinct logical clusters uh, per workspace of course you don't have to create it because the logical cluster is just an on the fly stuff it's just finally a place where you put uh, the case in etcd and so to have finally what we have today the main uh, logical cluster for workspace and the, the private one so for now i just have that the private uh, logical cluster for a workspace is just the name of the workspace with the two underscores which are not permitted in the name syntax and then based on these two levels of visibility have a two steps syncing so first you have a transformer at, at the level that syncs uh, from public objects, I mean, from objects in the public KCP logical cluster. So the one that is, um, you know, used by external controllers, and it would sync the objects from these public logical clusters to the corresponding private logical cluster. And doing this, it, you can, you know, add whatever customization you want to change the object, create other objects as well with own by, uh, relationships and then the sinker which is what we have today this would allow the sinker to keep really really systematic and simple extra simple because it would just have to look for uh, the resources that are created in the private logical cluster and sync that exactly as it does today uh, to the assigned physical cluster and then that means that we can but, but the the cool thing here was that in principle if we put transformation apart, it's exactly the same mechanism. So all the challenges, you know, of syncing back to the status, of syncing the spec, what will we do uh, of, you know, read-only fields and stuff like that, all these challenges we would have to um, manage only once. Uh, because, yeah, so first, I mean, and the benefits of this seems to me also that we we can now have we would now have a, a clear separation of concern between the scheduler that would work precisely at the KCP public level um, just by labeling or annotating objects, then the transformer that does the you know um, move between public and private and possibly transform objects, and then the syncer that just blindly syncs the objects and leaves in each physical cluster. And it you know, would be the same for everyone, which is also a sort of security growth for us, because then we can uh, be sure that that the sync to physical cluster is correctly uh, done and not overridden by anyone. Uh, and then for 
this allow, now that we have a layer for transformation, we can implement an extension quite easily, implement some sort of extension mechanism for transformers based on labels on the GVR. Uh, when you uncontrol an ingress, then you use a distinct transformer, for example, stuff like that. And in the future, of course, it could be driven by workspace policies or organization policy or something, something like that. Um, and it seems to me also that it covers the various thinking use case we've spoken of. So single fixed free physical cluster, the namespace scheduler that Jason has been working on, and also the spread um, deployments or any anything custom, especially use something I think we spoke about long ago about, you know, using KCP as a way to inject additional logic, for example, security guards between the abstract object that is created at the public um, uh, layer, KCP layer, and the object that will finally be uh, synced or not synced uh, to the physical cluster uh, at the end. Uh, so this, these are the benefits. And in terms of implementation, what I will show right now, if time allows, um, is, is in the Kubernetes feature branch, in fact, there was just a minimal implementation for this to be um, minimally performant. Which was which logical cluster? For now, we don't have CRD inheritance um, because it's quite hard to implement in the current state of, of the CRD management, which is mainly upfront and and you know uh, controller based. But uh, for for this case, it's very it's very easy because you have exactly the same APIs between the private and the public uh, logical clusters. So it was just some additional hacks. Uh, um, on top of the existing hacks on the cube feature branch. And then finally, you can you point to admin or underscore admin underscore logical clusters, and you get the same API resources and the same open API schema, and you can create object in either one or the other. And so that allowed then doing all the rest of the stuff on the KCP side, mainly abstract the sinker to allow a switching the syncing logic, you know, upset uh, to downstream, uh, update status into upstream and delete from downstream. And based on this, typically the old syncer is just the a an abstract syncer with the identity syncing. You just copy uh, without any transformation. And this identity syncing is also the default of you know, basic extension mechanism, which which is just you know prototype and an ID, um, where you can delegate to your custom logic per GVR, um, and it it's driven by labels. If you just add the transformer label on a on an ingress, for example, or on a deployment, uh, to use you know a, a transformer that would spread things across clusters, then then it would use this transformer instead of the default one, which just copies all the other objects like config maps or stuff like that. And yeah, and and this idea is that th this work would be ready for when the syncer supports multiple logical clusters. For now, because we are not clear um, currently on how we would manage APIs and different APIs, you know, and the API schemas and stuff like that, um, we don't have for now. Each thinker runs um, against. You, you have one in in each logical in each physical cluster. Sorry, you have one thinker for what for each logical cluster. But of course, the same approach could be used even if you um, would uh, watch uh, against uh, all the logical clusters based on labels or stuff like that. Um, yeah. So, I mean, just tell me. Um, so, do you see my my um, presentation or not? No. Oh, that's <laughs> that's a pity that nobody said. Oh anything no! Well, apart from you, Akim. Well, I will send it. Um, yeah, please, please share them. Um, I think I still followed fairly close. I mean, even I'm I'm sure visuals would have helped me, but uh, I think I think I still got the point I like uh, that that's I like the mean. idea <laughs> of making the sinker really dumb like I like that this this removes the transformation step from the sinker so, yeah that was it but but, no, it, but it loses okay. the property that the sinker is the one who's actually authorized to make those rights 
And so a dumb sinker is not a policy inject. Like a, a smart sinker located on a cluster can impose rules that you can't trust a smart sinker at the higher level to run because ultimately like policy has to be enforced somehow. And so mm -hmm. you lose the property of transformation is, um, is under the control of the person receiving the workload. And let so me know. Well, 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 I mean, it, it mainly depends where you run the transformer. I mean, um, and that's, that's non-opinionated. Uh, in, in my example, I, I mean, for the, the sake of the demo and, and, and the initial use case, uh, <clears throat> I would run the transformer against the logical cluster, and typically from a local machine. Uh, but we already even do that for the sinker, uh, I mean, in the local use case. But then, I mean, in um, finally, uh, you would just have to decide um, when, when we are in pool mode to decide whether the transformer or some default transformers for certain GVRs would be uh, at the KCP layer for optimization. And some others could be overridden as well uh, on the on the physical cl cluster. So where? So um, are you assuming yeah. that every write gets doubled? So every so, status <laughs> write is doubled? Because I does this like what what types does this not apply to? Right? Like because yeah. ingress is not I want to say a special case, but ingress is different than the others. Yeah, exactly. So that that's um, that's part of what I. Um, sorry, let me come back here. Yeah, that's part of what I said here, uh, that it would be ready for when single supports multiple logical clusters. For now, uh, <clears throat> um, I mean, that that that's not the case. So, I mean, for now, um, the sinker, which uh, is against the physical cluster, uh, mainly points to a given um, logical cluster, a single one. And so, of course, in the prototype, uh, I would present the demo of, um, it points to the private um, cluster. So for now, I mean, for the sake of simplicity of the demo, um, every object are copied. Even, you know, a config map or an object that doesn't need any change to the status would be copied. But of course, this type of duplication long-term is not really nice in terms of scaling, uh, that's clear. But as soon as even sinkers are, you know, enough KCP aware, uh, to be able to watch um, among, across logical clusters, then uh, they can just get all the, you know, every objects that are in the pri that I initially called as being in the private uh, visibility mode. Let's say it like that. Uh, would be created with the uh, could be created with a label. Let's say ready for sync or something like that. That means that. This could also be driven by a, a, a KCP policy or logic that for all the objects that just don't need any um, transformation, the sinker, which in the future we would look to all private cl logical clusters, uh, oh, sorry, would, would watch to all logical clusters, would retrieve objects from both the public logical cluster and the private logical cluster of a given workspace and then would simply um, get everything that is ready for sync and it's in such a case um, exactly the same way as it works today uh, in the prototype i showed you would just um, you know avoid uh, duplicating every object that doesn't need um, uh, some sort of transformation uh, in the middle so Maybe a question would be, so then this is effectively saying we have two copies of an object, one or potentially multiple for some, one per target. Is there any well, difference? Well, yes, so sir. no, maybe let, let's go back. So if, if like talking specifically about ingress going to two clusters and then being unified when it comes back up, yeah, I would have an ingress with a name that is the ingress name. How would I unify those? between two so i mean i have i have re-implemented the um, uh, the deployment splitter pattern uh, with this and it works exactly the same in fact apart from the fact that your deployment east and your deployment west that were created initially are, are created in a private logical cluster associated to to the public one so they are not seen by uh, you know if you do kubectl on kcp but then 
the thinker sees those two objects uh, exactly as before because they are labeled with the cluster name you know physical cluster name and and sinks the status and then i have a transformer that does exactly what the previous deployment splitter do does that means that when it updates the status um in upstream it will just get uh the, the the two the status of the two deployments that exist in the private zone let's say it like that and and update uh the real deployment with the right status which is uh, on the public zone and then it's exactly i mean what i tried to I, i'm not saying it would be the design you know uh, for the future but for now at least and and as 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 a proof of concept for an ID of isolation and visibility uh, management. Uh, that's how it works. I mean, using logical clusters and keeping exactly the same logic as before, but um, creating, having all the objects and all the modifications that we don't want them to be visible uh, in the private. So uh, why don't we want cluster. them to be visible? What what which what was an example of something we don't want to be visible? I may have missed that. Yeah, well, for, so um, that came from the the, the case of um, that workspace controller, for example. Um, according to how controllers are built, you might you might expect um, that with a given custom resource, for example, you will you would create a number of operands uh, of derived resources. And you would search, of course, if you find a resource that is not, I mean, that is with a number of labels, for example, and annotations um, that should not be created by, because the, 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 the um, uh, main uh, security has changed, then we could assume that some controller would just remove those objects. I mean, th that's just, just changes the, the, you just change the namespace or the content or the the environment that is the one of the external uh, controller targeting a given you know um, KCP um, namespace. Yeah. So, okay. And yes, that's one part of it. And the other part of of it is is related to um, when you want to sync, uh, you know, to transform the status typically for the the case where ingress is associated to a given cluster, a fixed cluster, uh, typically the, the, the DevOps space use case, for example, then you still have to change um, uh, the status that is in the ingress. And it doesn't seem a good thing to me that the initial host name value that is associated to uh, the ingress would be the one associated by the underlying physical cluster well so and that's actually that that leads into my next question so effectively what we're doing is there's a different set of ingress status that comes up from the cluster than mm -hmm. what exists at the lower level cluster and then at the higher level yeah. there's a there's two actual different types of status do those types of ingress status actually end up having the same schema or if not it might actually be that it shouldn't be represented as an ingress, at which point you're basically saying the same behavior that you would get out of a private workspace where you're keeping the same object. This use case is effectively saying, I need to take the data, I'm taking the spec from ingress, translating it down to a spec on a lower cluster, taking the status, transforming it back up, and then that status has to be unified by a higher level controller. At that point, isn't that roughly saying that instead of writing an ingress to a private, we should be writing an ingress status object to well, the public? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, of course, if we if we think only on the use uh, on the on the status uh, yeah, on the ingress use case, um, then you can restrict the you know, privacy requirement to the status. But then what do we do uh, for other use cases? We've been discussing about spread deployments and possibly well, so, even about so you know creating history, history virtual resource. 
from an ingress. Deployments ingress. is a composable type, unless we have, mm -hmm. like, I mean, I think like part of the problem here is that ingresses and deployments aren't the same. I guess I was kind of like, if an if a deployment, if a deployment status is composable, then we wouldn't need another resource for it. If it's not composable, like the ingress case, we do need another resource. And then the real question is, does that resource have a schema that's identical to its source status or not? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like what I'm getting at. So um, maybe I guess what I would ask would be, can we, can we specifically frame up and ask the question, is deployment composable or not? And if it's not, why not? And if it is, then, is there a difference between a composable status and a non-composable status, ingress being one example? And I guess like uh, I'm concerned because the uh, we've increased the total number of concepts by having a second private logical cluster a lot. Is that throwaway, right? So I guess the question would be, when I delete a workspace, do I have to delete that private workspace at the same time? I think KCP yeah. should be responsible for that. I don't think the user has to delete. Well, but they don't know about their private workspace, right? So right. So it, it complicates. It, it's basically a net new concept that sure. even though we say logical clusters are an underlying mechanism, uh, someone has to filter those out, right? So if they're in the same key structure, that means every private one can be listed at the same time. That may or may not be a feature. Well, we have to know whether something's private or not. Well, yes, I understand what you mean, but but I, I say. Yes or no? Uh, I mean, it it, it depends. Um, if if for example, if by default they are not just returned, uh, everything that is private is just not returned. In what right? Terms, but that means especially we, that means we always load all of those objects and we filter half of them out, so we double the cost of every mm -hmm. read. And yeah, that, that has so, properties, but then delete has to take that into account. This is something that who needs access to this like will admins need access to this so now we have like a a different type of workspace so that's kind of what i'm asking like yeah i think it's I mean, worth exploring i'm just trying to i want i want to get at the trade-offs that this new mechanism it makes moving a workspace harder if we have to preserve this like we're talking about shard rebalancing and the way to rebalance a shard is to watch the workspace and to stream it to the other side using a list watch and all the resource types mm -hmm. a little bit like sinker might that would have to change if we need to sync this. Now we maybe not, but like the, those trade offs are really just um, working through yeah. some of the examples helps us understand. It's totally worth mm -hmm. working through. I'm just, this is a good step. I really want to get to the doc form where we can present the trade offs and alternatives and go yeah, through it. Yeah. Cause like the trade off here is the schema for the status that's copied up has to be the same. If we can come up with a counter example and say, ah, no, but we want ingress status as returned from the sync logic up to the cluster to be different, that then says, oh, well, then we want a different resource. If we want a different resource, that means we should think about how someone would use that resource. That gives us enough input to, to make some drafts. So uh, this is this is great. Like, I actually like pushing the boundary here because it opens up you know, questions that we need to get better at answering, like the composability question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, I, I agree. I, I would love to uh, have this result in some document that says here is here is a possible way we could solve. Like, here's the problem. Here's a possible way to solve it. Trade offs, uh, ups and downs. An experiment only fails if you don't learn anything from it. So, like, we we uh, should understand what we're what we're going to get out of this. I wanted to. Um, so uh, two things. Two things that I like. One is the sinker is really dumb. I think Clayton had a had a point about that that I'll get back to. And the other is that the transformed state is visible outside of the physical cluster. So the transformed the 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 you gave me a resource and I applied a transformation to it. Uh, that's available at the KCP layer and not just stuffed in some internal state mm -hmm. in the in the sinker before it applies it to the physical cluster. I think that's a useful trait that I don't know is is worth the trade-offs, but I think that's another thing on the pile of nice things I like about this design. It means that the the it does mean double rights. It does mean or I mean it can mean double rights. It does mean that we have two versions of the same object mm. in different uh, you know the, the real object the user handed us in the trans transformed state. But I think it is useful to say to to allow users or even admins to say like you gave us this deployment we created these five, you know, split deployments out of it because that's how we decided to do it. 
and then we synced them down to the cluster and the cluster just applied it. Um, if the single, um, uh, if the KCP layer is just, is if KCP is the dumb layer and the sinker is the smart one doing transforms and applies on the, on the physical cluster, um, it's a lot harder for a user to see what was actually created back there. We're, we're abstracting to Adol's point. We are abstracting a lot and that's great. But sometimes when debugging these things, users will want to understand why we made that decision, and uh, or maybe not end users, but admins or somebody with you know. Yeah, some, that 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 was also software. with the idea of of you know being able to see the. Uh, I mean, if we had time to do the demo, but maybe not. I would post it. I think later on, after sure. the community call. Um, but yes, the idea is is just to be able to to see what has been created or spread or or transformed, but in an opt-in way. Not not by default. Yeah. Um. Uh. Sean has a hand up. Uh, yeah. Sorry. I sure. I work on the migration engineering team, and we ran into some similar problems here, where where we were making transformations underneath the hood, uh, while you were moving mm -hmm. between different types of clusters, uh, and we ran into the same set of problems where those transformations were very hard to explain, were hard to debug if anything went mm -hmm. wrong. That kind of thing, and we move to a we're moving to a to a kind of model where the transformations are much more outside the the scope of the actual the applying of the resources onto the given cluster, mm -hmm. so you can see them um, at that time. So I I just want to like throw that out there <laughs> and say that like I think that that makes sense. We saw some some problems um, by doing it in one big go, but. Uh, all the performance problems exist when you're trying to do that inside the controller. Like I think Clayton's bringing up. Yeah, yeah. To be fair, uh, before switching back or, or coming back to you know uh, using just two logical cluster, public and private, um, I thought about you know maybe storing in some cases just a diff or th things like that, and and using the object when when there is no change to do. But I mean, as a first start. Uh, I thought that it could be interesting to have something, even if it's not optimized because you copy everything. But then it shows the main ID, and then we can try to think of path to make the whole performance and, and yeah. possibly and, the underlying you know storage layer different. In in the um, I mean the modeling here, so like uh, the the clusterlet OCM uh, manifest work. This is a different variation of manifest work materialized through logical cluster um federation v2 <laughs> yeah. federation v2 chose to duplicate types on the spec side but honestly there's an element here of um if in the transparent constraint we're trying to avoid uh changing how people interact as much as possible so the the, the normal constraint is an object at the top level behaves the way you would expect in mm -hmm. the exceptions is ingress exception or not we don't know but i think it's reasonable yeah. that for well designed apis we're going to want to very much stick to that so like uh, let's take route for a second so in the route example mm -hmm. it's very clear that the default route as reported up is going to be, would would ideally be the one that is aware of at the higher level um, on status. So the um, the route, yeah, um, but... and the but the others could potentially be represented, but they would have to be namespaced, and that's only possible because route has the has already has built into the API the concept of multiplicity. So we know that we're going to hit APIs that don't have status multiplicity built in. And so our default approach for status multiplicity has to, you know, effectively what we're saying is when status is composable, we'll do one thing. If we do one thing when status isn't composable, is it consistent or inconsistent with status and composable? And is there a third category of status, which is almost composable, where the trade-off is the extra complexity uh, of, or, or the extra cost of a particular implementation pushes us to one side or the other. Basically, is all status composable or not composable? Or are there things in the middle which are mostly composable, where mm. for clarity, maybe we actually want to break them apart? Or for simplicity, we actually want to sponge them together. I'm just a bit uh, worried about the fact that we, we 
focus very much on the status, but we've not tackled the questions of, you know, um, field f um, fields that from the spec that are um, uh, also changed. Uh, for example, routes where I know that in the in the, in the current design of the Dev Workspace controller, for example, uh, to to guess that's just a hack, obviously, but to guess the the suffix of the current cluster, we just create a dummy root and get the assigned uh, host uh, name of the root, which is in the spec, and and that's just an example among a number of others in native tabs that that when you create an object, it will also you know, fill a number of fields in the spec that by default, uh, if if they have no no existing value, and obviously at some point we will have to answer about this question more generally, but but that seems to mean for me that that it's not uh, a, a status only. Uh, problem. Sure, but that problem that you just described there probably falls below the 95% or 97% cut line. It doesn't mean that we might not need to solve it, but mm -hmm. I don't, we, we cannot solve all problems caused by the existing abstraction in the existing yes, abstraction. We're mm -hmm. going after, is there enough value? Like, so prove by example that there's enough value for 95% and then identify the set of solutions for the remaining mm. problems, including the answer of just go design it a different way. Um, I think we're still too early to get to that, but I would agree that we're trying to get to that point by testing real important key objects, which is what we're doing. So maybe like we talked about deployment mm. and ingress, we have route, and then you have a couple of spec examples. Um, I feel like what I think we're at is I'm looking for the design document that says uh, we have a status problem. Here's a couple, here's the approach we're trying to solve. Here's three example resources that demonstrate different aspects of the status problem. Here's where they are similar and here's where they are different. And then um, what we are trying to do, and then like there's also spec, that's a separable problem, but that's also shows up in the same design doc or in a related design doc. Mm. And we're trying to get to a point where we can articulate and discuss the trade-offs and make sure we've considered all the options and then pick one and try it in the prototype. Mm. Um, and I'm mostly concerned about the doc because everyone has to be able to get on the same page for these because we will screw this up, guess wrong, and have to go back and try at least one of these other alternatives. So I, I think like it's good, it, it's good to say spec as well um, but let's start with status composable versus non-composable is at least what we talked about here deployment and ingress two examples are there other examples that are particularly representative i mean a three is probably enough to at least get started but we will have to as we go through the core types come in and say this type is falls under this solution if it's just one solution that's trivial but here's how we would solve it in this one and then we need to be able to add the counter examples like we're still in the because i think all of us can think of counter examples ideally there's a place that we can go to argue and add new counter examples yeah there's there's definitely nothing better than uh having some problem and finding the solution in the alternatives considered section of a design doc somebody wrote three years ago it's even better when you wrote that design doc three years ago. So e yeah. even even and old, more old, uh, old pleasant joy than that smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Old me was smart. Current me, yeah. Old me was smart. Um, Clayton, I wanted to I wanted to ask because uh, I remember the the point that you brought up before about the sinker being dumb. You mentioned that the the nice thing about a smart sinker is that it is able to use knowledge about the physical cluster it's sitting in to be able to know what kind of transformation to make. I was wondering if you have an example of that. Sorry. We, not Sorry, knowledge of the physical cluster, but it would okay. be under the control. So think about um, think about a cluster as a failure domain, but also as a security domain. The mm -hmm. advantage of the smart sinker is the smart sinker does not have to trust the control plane. That is a extreme like so cube today trusts the control plane. An early design point for Cube was like, oh, you know, the first version of security context and pod security policy and pod security was a flag on the cubelet that says, don't let it run any root workloads. 
That mm -hmm. is probably still the most effective security mechanism to keep a node safe. The problem is, is that today a kubelet has to be too general purpose. I do not think that the use case for the default transparent multi-cluster is general purpose, right? It is homogenous workloads, mm -hmm. or sorry, it's homogenous capacity, heterogeneous workloads that are not tied to that physical location, and instead use the provided abstractions within that to achieve cluster independence. That specifically means that it should not have root access on the node. That specifically means it may not use host volumes. That specifically means it may not do untrusted things. The enforcement and capability of that, if you allow the control plane to make those determinations, then you are effectively saying the control plane is root on these clusters. If you do not allow the control plane to do it, for instance, by the sinker having a Boolean flag or an alternative source of policy that comes from the cluster or insert mechanism ABC, an orthogonal source of truth that imposes hard constraints, you don't have to worry about the trust boundaries of the control plane. That alone is valuable. It's not perfect. So we know that there's some things that we would have to work around there, but it, it kind of gets to the, uh, that's one type of transformation. A second type of transformation would be use case dependent where an abstraction at the higher level for the workload, you actually want to virtualize. So for instance, say someone asks for at the control plane level, asks for uh, a new type of uh, a CSI driver that does not actually get installed on the cluster, but for which there is an exact one-to-one -one mapping. You can do that at the control plane level. It's really hard to do securely. And honestly, if the implementation varies between clusters because you're trying to make a consistent workload and footprint, you actually don't want you don't necessarily know at the control plane the details and you may not want to expose those to the control plane of how that mapping is done those are just two those are the two that i have right now um and i think there's equal argument jason for there are places where the control plane side is a better place to mm. to control mm -hmm. parts of the syncing and that would be when an end user brings something that they want to sync down that the underlying sinker is completely unaware of that's that's a policy object maybe in the that's like an, that's an influence on the the syncing policy or a transformation policy in the workspace in the organization that yeah. you know perhaps uh perhaps brings new workload types that are we, we haven't really talked about what that would look like but that's a case of yeah the control plane's fine to trust and you're already looking at that source for that sort of modification yeah. the end user is in yeah. charge of that Gotcha. Okay. That. Thank you. I think that that was a uh, that answers my question. I was thinking you were thinking of the sinker knows what types are available down there, and so would the workspace. But the the security uh, uh, boundary answer. And in the long run, just like in the long run, we want the APIs in use at the control plane level to mutate to best solve the problem that actual end users have, which is not pods, deployments, services, ingress. It is a set of problems of, I want it. So I think there's some level of we should expect APIs to change over time. Maybe we don't have to be the tip of the spear. When we go through all alternatives, we might say, we don't want to do it because it seems too hard, but we know others might. But we might also say, well, actually, no, one of the alternatives is this. We'll come back and consider it. And maybe we end up doing some variation of the alternatives, which is you know, a combination of some of the approaches, like transforming yeah. objects dynamically into sidecar uh, resources. Right. Uh, OK, great. Um, thank you, everyone. That's uh, that's an hour. Um, David, thank you for, for this. Uh, wonderful exploration and discussion. Uh, and we will see you again Welcome. all next week or online or on the Slack or in the internet. See you folks. Bye.